We're starting Beowulf today, <clears throat> and I've got five days assigned for it. We'll see if we're able to do it in that amount of time. Um, and the reason I say that is, as I was telling a friend last night, <clears throat> or as he was reminding me, former student of mine, uh, what I frequently say is it's the greatest poem in the English language. Even though most people don't recognize it, as the English language, but we'll talk about that um, as we go along. I've got to give you some background information beyond what's in the introduction, which is a bit presumptuous of me because um, the translator of the poem in our text, Roy Liuza, is one of the greatest Beowulf scholars alive today. Um, he's at the University of Tennessee at Knoxville. He really knows the poem well. Uh, but the introduction's a, a little bit brief, so I want to give some more background information. And I will be sending you uh, a couple of different files that I hope will help you understand um, the poem a little more, and I, I don't mean help elucidate the meaning of the poem, but help you follow characters, follow plot to some extent, also to have a, a spatial idea of where what is occurring is occurring, things like that. But a little bit of background. The events of the poem, that is, the time frame in which the poem is set, can be dated because at least one of the characters in the poem is real, actually lived. And that is the character of Helak, Beowulf's uncle. He really lived and really died. Um, his Frisian raid, that we'll talk about as we go through the poem, um, occurred in the early 6th century. And he died right around 520. We know this from a variety of historical works. Gregory of Tours wrote a history in which he mentions okay, Helot. Um, another man named Jordanes, Jordanus wrote Gregory of Tours, first of all, and then Jordanes, who wrote History of the Goths, Gregory of Tours wrote, which work of his is it in? He wrote a bunch of stuff. I think it might be what's called the Vita Patrum, which means Lives of the Fathers. <clears throat> And then Jordanes wrote History of the Goths, okay, and he mentions Helot. And then there's another book called Liber Monstrorum, okay, which is anonymously written. It simply means Book of the Monsters, or Book of Monsters, if you want. And Helot is mentioned there, okay. He likes considered in the Liber Monstrorum a monster because of his size. He was apparently very large. Um, I think it's the Liber Monstrorum that refers to his bones on this island in the middle of the Rhine. Uh, and if memory serves, which it may not, um, he's supposed to be something like eight feet tall. So a giant, if you want. Right. So all three of these works mention Helak. So we know Helak is an actual historical character. No other work in the world, anywhere, mentions Beowulf. No other work of English literature, no other work of Germanic literature. Beowulf is not found anywhere except for in this one poem. And yet, the poem mentions other stories about Beowulf. 
But Paul mentioned, you know, that Beowulf's deeds have preceded him when he arrives in Denmark, and that everybody kind of already knows who he is. The only problem is none of those stories have, so to speak. Okay? So the, the action in the poem occurs early 6th century. The poem itself, that is when it created, whoever created it, we have no idea who. Well, take that back. Some people think they have ideas who. Um, dates serve from between probably around 700 AD to, at the absolute latest, 1025, okay? And this issue, dating of the is one of the most hotly contested critical issues um, really in English literature because you have very firmly defined camps. Those who will take a, an earlier date and those who will suggest a later date. Okay? And when I say earlier date, that's generally, we do this, Generally, 8th century. Okay. Later date is pretty much anything after that. With even one scholar, Kevin Kiernan, formerly, I don't think he's still there, at University of Kentucky, suggesting that Beowulf dates from this period, 1025. All right. And we'll talk a little bit about Kiernan's theory and why he suggests that. <laughs> later on. I'm going to come back to this in a moment. The manuscript that preserves the wolf, that is the manuscript in which it is inscribed, we can date. We can date it fairly closely to roughly 975 to 1025, as we can all of the four major um, Old English poetic codices. So, it obviously can't be later than 1025 because the manuscript that contains it is dated at its end, 1025. Can obviously be earlier. I mean, even when we say 700, there's no reason that the story, the kernel or the germ of the story, doesn't go back to this period. I mean, because when you get back that far, shrouded in the mists of history, we have no idea. Maybe back there, there really was somebody named Beowulf. Okay. We just don't know. His name is um, nowhere else. Okay. Now, let me come back to this for a moment. And here's why. How you date the poem determines how you interpret the poem. That is, whether or not you think the poem is or late influences how you can read the poem. And here's why. If the poem is early, let's say, let's assume that the poem dates 725, 750. Okay? You then have a period from, let's say, 750 to this period when it gets written in the manuscript that preserves it now. You have a period of 250 years, okay, where that poem has got to be passed on from one generation to the next. I don't mean it has to be passed on in written form, but it at least has to be passed on orally, okay. So if it, if if some original show created it, in it's got to get you know from the time of. That shows creating of the poem to the death of that show, let's say 40 years later, somebody else then has to pick it up and tell it. And it has to get passed down. Okay? Roughly 250 years, about eight generations, if we take generation to be approximately 40 years. Okay? So if that happens, then how long was at its creation? And the form of the poem that we have now could be two vastly different things. 
Because, as an example, if I were to suddenly say, stop writing and hand me in your notes, and just were to take them one by one and read them aloud, would all of you be writing down the exact same thing? No. And that's how it would be passed down, the same way. Because there, if it were passed down orally, it wouldn't even be based on written notes. So one person might hear it one way, memorize it, speak it. Somebody else might hear it one way, memorize it, speak it. And then you have whoop, the diverging line of transmission. The only problem is we only have one copy. We don't have multiple. Right? So if you accept an early date, you've got this, this problem of how did the poem get passed on from this period all the way down to this period? Right? That's one problem with the early date. Here's another one, and this one's content. Okay. How many of you have read Beowulf before? How many of you have read the real Beowulf before? I don't mean like the high school AP English version, which is horrible. I mean, it's just absolutely horrible. Okay? Shouldn't be taught at all. Ought to be burned. National ceremony. Book burning. <clears throat> I can just hear the headlines. You know? um, <laughs> here's why. This is, um, this is important. Who is celebrated in this poem? other than the character Beowulf. What nationality are these people? Danes. The people being celebrated are Danes. What is the language that the poem is written in? It's Old English. It's not Old Danish. They are different. Okay. It is Old English. What begins to happen to England? A little bit of quizzing here previous talks, what begins to happen in England in the late, very late, 8th century? The Vikings. Viking invasions. Who's the biggest part of the Vikings? Danes. Okay. Dane and heathen are synonymous terms in Anglo-Saxon. Some poor schmo writes his poem celebrating the Danes in approximately 700 AD. And then less than 100 years later, the Danes start raiding and pillaging. Okay? Raping, killing, plundering. And it goes on for, with intermittent periods of peace, about 200 years. How do you get a poem that celebrates the ancestors of the people that are ruining your land? to get passed on. Who's going to want to stand up in the meat hall and go, hey, I've got a great story to recite for you tonight. It's about Beowulf and the... While, you know, they've got to look out to make sure there aren't any Danes coming. This, this is a serious kind of issue. Because the Danes were regarded as devils. Scourges. Right? But if you take a later dating for the poem, that's not an issue. Okay? Even though the Danes are still ravaging and pillaging. And here's one of the reasons why. And this gets to another critical area of understanding Baal. By critical, I mean criticism. Where was its place of composition? Where was it composed? Was it composed up in Northumbria, like where Bede was when he wrote his ecclesiastical history and where Cadman was when he created Cadman's hymn? Was it down towards London or Kent? Was it over in Wessex ruled? We don't know. And one of the reasons we don't know is because the poem preserves dialectal features from all of those areas. I mean, one explanation for these dialectal features some scholars have proposed is that the poem started out in Northumbria, and then it, it kind of moved around. 
And as it moved around, different shops, poets, okay, took it, and as every one of us does, modified it to our own dialect. Intentionally. Couldn't help but do it. So where the original might have said frying pan at one point, a southerner picks it up and it becomes a skillet. Okay. And you see instances like that in the poem where you have a, a northernism at one point and then later on a southern. Okay. Beowulf's name is spelled. For example, in the poem, two different ways. B-E-O-W-U-L-F and B-I-O-W-U-L-F. Each of those representing a different pronunciation. Okay? So, if it's late, what it might suggest is something about where the poem was composed. And I'll talk about this more when we get to the end, because I'll throw on you my interpretation or, or understanding of it, okay? I'm trying to think, is there any other background? No, let's just start. <clears throat> the poem opens, and you've got the, on page 46, you've got a facsimile image of the first leaf of the poem. And there's that great big whack that we talked about the other day with the beginning of Dream of the Rude. Notice on this side, well, let me start over here. Notice, you know, this edge of the page, it's all nice and straight. And the bottom, for the most part, is straight. But the top's all kind of jagged. And this side's just all messed up. Okay. Here's why. This edge here is the equivalent of this edge. In other words, this is where it was bound. Okay? This edge is the outside edge. In 1731, there is a file in the library of a man named Robert Bruce Cotton. Cotton was antiquarian. He collected old stuff. Okay? Among the old stuff he collected were manuscripts. He had the Beowulf manuscript. He had the manuscript that contains Sir Gowan of the Green Knight. He had a whole bunch of manuscripts. Right? And the way he arranged these manuscripts, I'll come back to the fire in a moment. The way he arranged these manuscripts is he had bookcases in the library lining the walls. Okay? On top of each press bookcase, he had a bust of a Roman emperor. So like Nero and Claudius and Tiberius and Julius, blah, 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 blah. Okay. The Beowulf man, which is called Cotton V15, okay. the Beowulf manuscript was in the bookcase that had the bust of Vitellius on the top. The A15 tells us how Cotton cataloged his manuscripts or his collection. Think of this as early Library of Congress, but it's Library of Cotton. A is the first shelf, etc. on down. 15, 15th item over from the left. That's all he did. A15. But if you were to go to the British Library today, which is where the Beowulf manuscript is, and ask them for this, you wouldn't get to see it. <laughs> There's maybe 10 people in the world that have actual access to it because it's so fragile. Because of the fire. But what you would do is you would fill out a little slip of paper and it would ask for the shelf mark, and you would write down Cotton Vitelli's. And a couple hours later, they would bring the manuscript out to you. Okay? Beowulf is always on display. It's not on display 
at the British Library is when there is a scholar examining it for one reason or another. Okay? So, back to this. In 1931, there was a fire in Cotton's Library. And what they did, while attempting to put out the fire, is they literally grabbed the manuscripts and threw them out the window. Some of them landed in the Thames, some of them landed in the ground. Okay. Many of them were burned. Beowulf was burned on that outside edge. Okay. From the time of the burning to today, well, let me take that back. From the time of the burning to the early 20th century, more of the edge fell off because somebody copied the manuscript, uh, a uh, Norwegian, copied the uh, the Danish guy, copied the manuscript in the late 1700s, 1780s. And there's a lot more letters that were here than show up now, all right? Beowulf survived, obviously. Sir Gowan and the Green Knight survived. A lot of manuscripts didn't survive. But some did literally as lumps of charcoal. And the British Library, in its wisdom at the time, because the, the manuscripts were, um, Cotton's entire library was donated to the British Library. The British Library, in its wisdom, kept those lumps of charcoal, and essentially put them away. And now, through enhanced computer technology and stuff I don't understand, they can actually read what is in the charcoal. Yeah. It's, I can never remember this one. Okay. Kind of like if you've ever had an MRI. It takes little slices, as it were, of your body. Well, with the chromospectography, what they can do is take little slices. Ink charcoal appears different than vellum charcoal. Okay. They can tell the difference. This has been done not only with manuscripts from Cotton's library, this has been done with manuscripts from a library about 2,000 years older than his. Manuscripts discovered in Pompeii, destroyed by Mount Vesuvius. Manuscripts discovered in the ancient library of Millennium, which was just discovered about five years ago. People knew that there was this library. Nobody knew where it was. Well, Herculaneum has been excavated, and there's this treasure trove of manuscripts, and they've gradually started to decipher some of these lumps of charcoal. You know, individual lines have been found, for example, of works by Sophocles that had been lost for 2,500 years. Works that we knew Sophocles wrote, but we didn't have any surviving examples. Well, words. We probably won't get entire plays, things like that. Okay. So, stroke of fate, a fortune, will of God, and you know, however you want to put it, Beowulf survived. You know, to plague English students from then on. So, we open with listen, plat, however you want to translate. Heard of the glory in bygone days of the folk kings of the spear days, how those noble lords did lofty deeds. Let me read you a little bit in Old English to, to help get the flair for this. Now, put yourself in an Anglo-Saxon setting to, I think, to really get the, the flavor of how this works. You're in a meat hall, and the meat hall looks something like this. It's long and rectangular, 
if you were looking at it from the top, it would be like that. It would have a door at one end. It might have a door at the other end, but it might not. And it would just have a hole in the center of the roof. Okay. The roof would be thatched. It may not be thatched well, but it would be thatched. The sides of the building would probably be planks okay. set like this. Inside, there would more than likely be a couple of major timbers that would support the roof structure. And so inside, if you're looking at it from this kind of perspective, looking down, okay, you'll probably have a couple of posts like this supporting rafters right, that would then probably come up something like that. Right? In the floor would be a big hearth, just a fire pit. Right? Around the fire pit would be benches or tables. Benches on either side of the tables. And he, one of these two locations would be where the lord of the hall, or the king, if this were a kingly dwelling, would sit in his big chair. Then there might be a smaller chair nearby, you know, for his wife or and mm -hmm. children, etc. If he has a, a prized storyteller or historian, that person would sit here at his feet. But then the people occupying these places would be his thanes, his personal knights. Think of the secret service. Okay? And so, you know, at the, let's say, the dinner meal time. There would be torches on the pillars. There would be torches, some on the walls. But it would still be kind of dark. And you'd have the smoke rising from the fire, and it'd be smoky inside. Because it's not a chimney. It's just a hole in the roof. If you've ever been building like that, okay, the smoke doesn't automatically just rise nice up to the ceiling. It goes and then it might spread out, especially if it's cold. So it's a not a good, healthy environment to, um, to live in. And if it's stormy outside, think of that passage in Bede where the one priest talks about what life is like. If it's stormy outside and it's thundering or it's hailing or something, there would be a lot of insulation. In fact, there wouldn't be any insulation. And so that storm would be rocking or rolling outside, and you would hear every bit of it. So that's kind of the, the setting, I think, to imagine yourself in. When somebody stands up and says, What? We gardena in yardagum third kinning a thrim ye through none. Who the atheling is Ellen Framadon? Oft shield shed than a threatum. Monigum maithum made a settle oftia. Esto de erla sithen erst worth, face shaft fund, ethos frovra ye bad, wax under wolknum, worth minum tha, oath at him idle quilch, thara imsitrin the overhornrad a iron shoulder, gomben gilden, that was gold kinning. That is, we have heard of the glory and bygone days of the folk kings of the spear days, how those noble lords did lofty deeds. Often shield shoving seized the meat benches from many tribes, troops of enemies, struck fear into earls. Though he first was found a way if he awaited solace for that, he grew under heaven and prospered in honor until every one of the encircling nations over the whale's riding had to obey him, <coughs> grant him tribute. That was a good king. All right? Now I'm going to pick apart the translation a little bit. And we won't do this for the entire 3,182 lines, or we'd never finish. But I'm going to do it for a lot of them. Notice how the speaker begins. What's the tense? Have heard. We have heard. Okay. Of the glory in bygone days. 
of the folk kings of the spirit dance. Notice what he's not talking about. We're not talking about their glory now. We're talking about their glory in, as Leuza translates it, bygone days. Okay. You heard me say in Yair Dabu. Literally, this would be year, but it's past. Days of. Days of your. Okay. The reason he doesn't translate it days of your, how does that sound? How many people say, oh, in days of your, nobody does. It sounds old. problem I have with Roy's translation is it's supposed to sound old. The speaker is telling us at the time that when he stands up to sing this song, he's going to relate something that happened a long time ago. The implication is there are not these kinds of glorious spear danes anymore could have something to do with the composition of the poem, when it was composed and where it was composed, how those noble lords did lofty deeds. And then he gives us an example of one of them. Often, Shield Sheving, his name means Shield, S-H-I-E-L-D, you don't like the Avengers, Shield, okay? Shield Sheving. Sheving means son of sheaf. So that in the early part of the 20th century, in the late 19th century, people would read that and they would go, oh, shield the son of the sheaf. Well, that obviously means this is some kind of fertility god because a sheaf is a sheaf of wheat and that implies, you know, producing goods for the tribe and this is this kind of anthropomorphized god of nature and greenery and stuff. What a bunch of hooey. <laughs> no, it's talking about a man named Shield, the son of Chef. That's all it means, okay? Often this Shield seized the mead benches from many tribes. Well, he doesn't really seize the mead benches. The old English word that's used there is oftea, which means he took or he deprived okay, these people of their mead benches. So, okay, what does that really mean? Does that mean he went and you know, knocked on their hall and said, can I borrow your mead benches? We're having a party. <laughs> When it says he took their mead benches, he deprived them of their mead benches. He means their mead benches became, to use a word from the wanderer, idle, empty. How idle and empty? He killed them all. <laughs> That's what he did. That's why their mead benches were empty. He killed the inhabitants of the other halls. All right? Troops of enemies, he struck fear into earls. The struck fear, the old English word there is that word that I said, esoda. I like struck fear. I like another word even better, however. Because of our recent history, he terrorized the earls. Shield shoving in our modern parlance was a terrorist. Okay. So he first was found a waif. He was a foundling. I mean, how many people use the word waif? Or he's an orphan. would be even better. He just kind of appeared one day. How does he appear? In a boat. As a baby. Any Moses. Moses. Well, what does shield shoving do? He's like Moses. He delivers the people who 
land he comes into, he delivers them from the fear of their enemies. <clears throat> and we're told he awaited solace for that, that is for arriving as a wife. He grew under heaven, prospered in honor until every one of the encircling nations over the whale's riding, and you've got a gloss there what that means, had to obey him, grant him tribute. Here's what that ultimately means. All the people from the neighboring tribes and across the water that bordered their tribe feared him, they paid him tribute. All right? He really scared people, in other words. And then the poet has this nice little succinct phrase to describe good old shield Chevy. That was a good king. So, good king. Someone who does what? Terrorize. Terrorize too. Not his own people. His enemies. Okay. And, as a result of that terrorizing his enemies, what was he able to achieve? He enlarged his kingdom. I mean, when he deprived others of their mead benches, he doesn't just go off and kill all these others and leave their halls and leave their gold. No, he expands his kingdom, right? And in doing so, what does he do for his own kingdom? <coughs> protects it. He's defending his people. This is a good king, the speaker says, all right? We're going to see that phrase, that was gold kinning. Three times in the poem. Two times it's going to be that exact phrase. One time it's going to be just ever so slightly changed. It's going to be, Ach, fat was gold king. Okay. Ach, but he was a good king, too, because that's what it means at that passage. So we find out, I'm going to skip a bunch. Actually, I'm not. <laughs> A boy was later born to him. Sorry. I forgot I needed to actually talk about that. Young of the courts, whom God sent as a solace to the people. So Shield Shevin has a son, and it doesn't mean necessarily this is a literal direct line of descendant son. Son here could be grandson, great grandson, but it it doesn't have to be. Here it is actually the case where he's a son. And what is the son? God sent the son as a solace to the people. The word that's used there that we use and translates solace is a word that comes up repeatedly in the poem. It's fervent. Okay. He translates it as solace. I would change that to consolation. God grants Shield Sheving's son as a consolation to the people. Okay? I'm not saying you have to admit, I'm just saying that's how I would translate it. Who did what? He, that is God, saw their need, the dire distress they had endured, lordless, for such a long time. The Lord of life, the wielder of glory, gave him worldly honor. Beowulf, the son of S.H.I.E.L.D., was renowned. Not the Beowulf that the poem is named for. Okay? There are two Beowulfs. You call this the early Beowulf, or the proto-Beowulf, or the pre-Beowulf. Okay? His fame spread wide in Scandinavian lands. Yet we've never heard any story about this Beowulf. Unless the Beowulf that the poem is about is this Beowulf. In which case, he's not necessarily the direct descendant of Shield Shevin. Okay? He could be descended through long years, as Aragorn says in The Lord of the Rings, from his ancestors. And then the poet gives us this Interesting little passage. 
after it talks about Beowulf and his fame spread throughout the lands, thus should a young man bring about good with pious gifts from his father's possessions, so that later in life loyal comrades will stand beside him when war comes. The people will support him. With praiseworthy deeds, a man will prosper among any people. Now, I used to be, and I've not necessarily given up on it, I just haven't done anything in years on it. I used to be working on a book on Beowulf, and I've got, in filing cabinets, a stack of articles, four feet tall, about just about almost everything that's been written by Beowulf that I can read. <clears throat> And I've not come across anything really that talks about this little passage, which I think is interesting because the passage in and of itself, I think is pretty key. Because listen to what it says again. A young, thus should a young man bring about good with pious gifts from his father's possessions. Why? So that later in life, loyal comrades will stand beside him when war comes. Jump to the end of the poem. Those of you who have read Beowulf before, or even if you saw the horrible movies, doesn't matter which one, because they're all equally horrible. What happens to Beowulf, our Beowulf, late in life? What must he confront? A dragon. How many of his men come help him? Okay. What about all the other men that came with him? He does order them to stay, stand aside. This is my battle. Why? Because I'm bad. I'm the monster killer. You guys aren't. Glory will be mine. You know, all that kind of stuff. But after the battle, we hear Wheeloff say a bunch of stuff like, where were you guys? Beowulf gave us all this great treasure, all this great wealth, all this great armament, and you didn't do anything with it. Thus should a young man bring about good with pious gifts from his father's possessions. Well, how do you bring about good with gifts from your father's possession? Give them away. A good king in Anglo-Saxon society gives away treasure. A good king doesn't hoard treasure. There's only one kind of person or thing that hoards treasure. are never good. So, if you give away your treasure, what should be the result? Later in life, loyalists will stand beside you when war comes. Your men will support you. Which is not what happens with Beowulf. One does. Okay? So, I think that little passage is pretty interesting because it ties directly to the wall. Yet nobody talks about this. So, Shill dies, passes away at his appointed time. The mighty Lord went into the Lord's keeping. And what do we get? We get this description of Shill's death and burial. It's not really a burial. okay? Because what do they do? Put him on a boat, they load the boat up with his treasure, all the stuff he had, and send him off to the ocean. Why? Because that's how he came. He came with treasure, however. He came poor, he leaves wealthy. All right? And the speaker gives us this long passage, line 30 through 50, about all the stuff that's buried with him. Okay, or that's put in the boat, let's say. I mentioned the other day, Sutton Hoo, this archaeological site, that in 1938, the land that is Sutton Hoo, she was curious about all the mounds. She knew they were burial mounds. Didn't know if they had anything still in them. It shows she hired a local archaeologist to excavate one of them. 
and he picked the biggest one, okay, and excavates. And what he finds is the outlines, as he digs down, he finds the outlines of a long ship, 90 feet long. The rivets, the rusted metal rivets are still there. You can see the impression of the plank in the sand, planks in the sand, and treasure. Lots of treasure. Gold coins, gold metal work, silver cups, just all kinds of stuff. So they have to have a coroner's to determine who the treasure belongs to. Does it belong to the lady on whose land it was found, or does it belong to the crown? Because of this law that says that if it is a burial, okay, if the material was interred into the ground, never to be dug up again, then it becomes property of the uh, person whose land it is on. If, however, it is thought to be treasure, that is, it was put in the ground temporarily for someone to come back later and take it up, then it becomes a crown. So they had to determine, with no body being present, why was this stuff here? Okay, keep in mind, it's got a 90-foot boat buried. One of the pieces of evidence they used to determine that this was a burial are these lines from Beowulf. They were actually entered into the record because everything that's described from line 35 to 47 were found. Okay? Many treasures were there, adornments from distant lands. Blades, beernies, battle weapons, war gear. Um, a ensign high over his head. At Sutton Hoo, the material that was found wasn't just local in area. Okay? There was a three foot wide bowl, dish. Not big, deep bowl, but like a big, huge platter. That was from Alexandria, Egypt. There was material from Sweden, we know, because we know the make. And we know that there were certain foundries in the Anglo-Saxon Germanic world where certain things were made. Okay? There were coins from Gaul. There was material from Byzantium. So this wasn't just your average, everyday, ordinary Joe that was buried. And there were two spoons. Look like this. Kind of. And on one of them was inscribed in Latin letters, Paulos. And on the other was inscribed, Salos. Paul, thought to be baptismal spoons to show the change from Saul into Paul. I'm not suggesting this was, you know, St. Paul's burial, okay? But it is thought to have been probably the burial of the convert, and the idea was that it was this guy that we read about with Bede, King Radwald. Okay, of East Anglia. This is in East Anglia. Because one of the interesting things about Radwald is he did convert from his heathenism and then he had second thoughts. And kind of reconverted, unconverted back. Just how did we, however you put that. Size, let's say. Okay? And when he apostatized, essentially what he did was he had a Christian altar erected <coughs> and then in another building right a pagan altar he right He figured he's going to cover his bets. You know, either, you know, one way he wouldn't be wrong. Okay? Beautiful stuff, and it's used in this coroner's inquest to determine whether or not the material is treasure or was determined to be grave goods. In other words, it all belonged 
to Mrs. Elizabeth Petty. She immediately granted the crown to the crown, to the government, said it's yours. Okay. The property became the property, but she said all the graveyards, keep in mind this was from one mound. There's over 20 of these. Many of them, because they did excavate some of the others, many of them had already been dug into and robbed. It's the problem with a lot of barrows in England is grave robbers from the 17th century and later get down and destroy everything, but do um, take the good stuff away. Okay? So we find after the prologue, then Beowulf Shilding, beloved king, was famous in the strongholds of his folk for a long while, his father having passed away. And Beowulf dies, and after him rose up the great Halfdane who held the glorious shieldings all his life. Half Dane is a historical figure also. Okay? And Half Dane has four children. This is where, if you've ever read this before, you're really going to start to hate this poem. Because the speaker loves to introduce names. Okay? We have Beowulf shield up here. Half day. And half day has one, two, three, four children. Okay? And their names, we're told, are Haragar, Hothgar, and Holga the Good. So, Haragar, Hrothgar, Holga, and a sister who's unnamed. She is named in other sources. If we can take this genealogy and apply it to Norse stories, okay, which gives the exact same genealogy, we're told her name is Irsa, like Ursa. Okay? So three boys, one sister. We're going to see another that's going to have three boys and one sister. Okay. And then we're going to see another genealogy that has two boys and no sisters. So Aragor, Hrothgar, Holiga, and this sister Ursa. And we say, or we read, I heard blank was Onela's queen. Her. At this point in the story, he don't know who Anula is, right? But it's pretty safe to assume that an Anglo-Saxon audience would go, oh, why? Because they'd already heard stories. They already knew who Anula was. Okay. And they were told this in war was given to Hrothgar, honor in battle, blah, 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 blah. Wait, whatever happened to Herogar? And just... <laughs> He's removed from the picture. Okay. Hrothgar is going to tell us later on, Herogar died. Okay. So Hrothgar is granted, we're told, success in battle. He becomes a great and mighty king. How great and mighty? So great and mighty that he decides to build the greatest hall known to man because God had granted him all the stuff. Right? And we find out what kind of king he was, line 70 and following. He's going to build this great hall, which the sons of men should forever remember. And there inside he would share everything with young and old that God had given him. In other words, he will distribute the treasure. That's a mark of a good king. Everything God had given him, except for the common land and the life. That is, he's not going to parcel out to his things the land that belongs to the entire tribe. In other words, there is a of a commonwealth. Okay? And what else doesn't he give? Slaves. He doesn't give slaves. That's what's meant by the lives of men. Okay? So we get the hall built, and the hall is named Herat. 
which we're told means heart. Okay. And Roy mentions there, you know, an item recovered from Sutton Who had a heart. And the item looks like this. It's a stone, has a little cat kind of thing down here. <clears throat> I'm not an artist. Okay. That is taken to be either a scepter or a royal whetstone, like for sharpening knives and such. And it's got this funny little cap on it, so that a lot of people think it's for somebody to be sitting in a chair, have his knee bent, and have this little cap sitting on the top. Of okay. So that it just fits right there. But this is a deer or a stag, if you want, on a heart. So he builds this great big hall. It's towered. It's got horns on the gables. And all that means is if you're looking at the building from the outside, and you see, the gables do that. Okay, the beams cross over. Right? But didn't listen to the, tall, the hall towered high and horn gabled. It awaited hostile fires, the surges of war. Time was not yet near that the sword hate of sworn in-laws should arise after ruthless violence. They've just had the ribbon-cutting ceremony, and what does the poet do? What's going to happen to this beautiful hall? It's going to burn to the ground. Why is it going to burn to the ground? What kind of feud? Family. Family feud. Okay. Now, if I had assigned, rather than the Broadview Anthology, and you had the Norton Anthology, the editor of the English section in the Norton Anthology, whom I can't remember who it is, states that Beowulf only touches on the idea of feud. Couldn't be more wrong. Feud is at the heart of the poem. We see it from the beginning of the poem. What does Shield Sheving do, after all? He starts feuds with his enemies around him. Okay? We see it here, and here it's family. It is among close relations. In-laws, we're told. And this idea runs all the way throughout, okay, to the end of the poem. And what's the very next thing? A bold demon who waited in darkness wretchedly suffered all the while. So the hall gets built. It's beautiful. It's glorious. The poet says, oh, and by the way, it is going to burn to the ground as a result of family warfare. Now let me introduce you to Grindel. <laughs> because Grindel is what? The son of, through many generations, Cain. Well, <laughs> what did Cain do? Killed his brother. Family feud. It's right there at the beginning. Okay? Pardon? I definitely misread that part. Okay. I thought he was saying that, like, Grindel was, like, the embodiment of what Cain was. Well, that's a... I was, like, reading it more, like, supernatural. No, that's really good. Uh, and, and I'm going to talk about that when we get to uh, just a little bit, because that brings up Kevin Kiernan's theory, which I'll talk about in a moment. So, Grindel... When it says a bold demon, it doesn't mean, you know, he's this disembodied spirit who possesses people. What's meant by demon is a foul person, a horrible monster. It doesn't mean a monster with three heads and eight arms. Okay. Why does Grindel suffer? Okay, notice that word, wretchedly. From what we've seen in earlier poetry, what does that word mean? He's in exile. He's not welcome. He's an outsider. All right? 
He suffered all the while. Why? Because he hears the joyful din loud in the hall. He hears singing. He hears the harp. And he hears the shope sing. And what does the shope sing? He said, the shope who was able to tell of the origin of men that the Almighty created the earth, a bright and shining plain, by seas embraced and set triumphantly, the sun and moon, blah, blah, blah. The shop is singing Cadman's hymn, essentially. What's he singing about? Creation of the world. And every day, Grendel has to hear about God creating the world. And it drives him crazy. Thus this lordly people lived in joy, blessedly, until one began to work his foul crimes. A fiend from hell. The grim spirit was called Grendel. Nobody really knows what Grendel means. The best guess is that it, is that it comes from the old English verb, grenda, which we know of as to grind. Because what does he do? He eats people. He grinds them in his teeth. Right? He was a, we're told, mighty stalker of the marches. How many of you know what a march is? It's not, you know, it's not that kind of march. Okay? It's the borderlands. You have in England, if I were to draw a map of England, that, that big area that you know we referred to earlier, I mean, England kind of goes up like that and again. Here, it's got up here. You've got this big area that today is called the Midlands. Didn't used to be called the Midlands. It used to be called Mercia. Mercia. Okay. It's the marches. Why? Because it's the border area between nice, civilized, southern England, Wessex, Alfred's kingdom, and those crazy picks and Scots up north. Okay? So we're told he did what? He was a mighty stalker of the marches. Think of a big cat in a cage at a zoo. What does the cat do? It paces back. Why? Just open that door <laughs> and it'll be out. That's what Grindel's doing. He's marching. He's moving around that border area. Okay? Who held the moors and fence. He holds the moors and fence because who wants to live there? The moors are high, desolate, cold. The fins are dank, smelly, wet, and full of Mosquitoes and such. This miserable man lived for a time in the land of giants. Notice, now he's not a fiend or demon from hell. He's a miserable man. He lived for a time in the land of giants after the Creator had condemned him of Cain's race. Doesn't mean he's, you know, 8,000 or 8 million years old or anything. Okay? When he, that is Cain, killed Abel, the eternal Lord avenged that death. So if the Lord avenged that death, then what does that mean? Cain created a feud between himself and God. Okay? And if Cain created a feud between himself and God, what does that mean for everybody down from Cain? They're also in that feud. No joy in that feud. The maker forced him far from mankind for his foul crime. That is, Cain. Cain had to go east of Eden to the land of Nod. From thence arose, that is from Cain, arose all misbegotten things, trolls and elves and the living dead. Living dead, if I remember correctly. That's, he's translating the word for which we have no translation. Yeah. From him awoke Eatinus and Ilva and Orkneus Sridja Gigantus. Eatinus, giants, 
ilva els on orkneas. That's the word he translates as the living dead. It's the word Tolkien works from. Okay? And then also giants. Which giants? The giants who strove against God for a long while. Go back to the book of Genesis. The Nephilim that are referred to. Okay? He, God, gave them their reward for that. So we're told who Grindel is. Now, back to your comment about Cain. When we see that line there among Cain's race in the Old English, in the manuscript, the manuscript actually says this. Okay? Because in Old English, when you write a M or an N, often what you see is that the scroll will forget to put those little ligatures in. Okay, so you'll see one, two, three, one, two. But what we have is this. Notice, this can be I, N, because it doesn't have a dot above it. Or it can be M. Okay? And actually, I, I misspoke there. Actually, it says this. C-A-M-E-S. Every editor emends that to that. Because Camus, who's Camus? Who did Camus kill? Or Cames, or whatever you know, pronounce his name. Well, the, the issue Kevin Kiernan suggests is this may not be a scribal type. Because this word, C-A-M-E-S, equals means or literally the place of conflict <clears throat> comes from the Latin compus campus place of conflict <laughs> okay so he argues you know this isn't necessarily wrong we shouldn't amend it just because we think it's wrong it can be read as among what's race? Conflict race. All human conflict. Race of Cain. Because Cain is the source of the first conflict. So, night goes out, and what happens? Grindel comes. He wanted to see how the Ring Danes had bedded down after their beer drinking. The poet makes explicitly clear, Grendel only comes when? After they've had their yaber shippah. After they've been drinking. And when Beowulf gets there, he's going to talk about the Danes and their beer drinking. So Grendel comes, and he kills a bunch of guys. Morning comes, and they see what a mess the place is. Next night, he comes back. And we're told, then it was easy to find a thing who sought his rest elsewhere. Why? It's a not a way of saying the danger cowards. <laughs> None of them want to attempt to fight him. So I'm going to skip a bunch. Go down to 160. Thus the foe of mankind, fearsome and solitary, often committed as many crimes, cruel humiliations. He occupied Herat, the jewel of in the dark nights. Line 160, 168. He saw no need to salute. It's just an asinine translation. Because it's wrong. And here's why it's wrong. The Old English says, No, hey. Greken Mosta. Literally, not he, 
that gift stool or throne to Greek, to Greek was Abel. Now put that in modern English. Was not able or allowed to greet or I'll leave that blank for a moment. That throne. And I'm not saying, you know, that grin was a little slow up to the chair going, hello chair. It's not that kind of greet. Okay. It's occupied. The old English text says, um, he occupied Heroth, the jewel adorned all in the dark nights. He saw no need to salute the throne. He scorned the treasures. He did not know their love. The Old English reads, um, Man, it's just the Maldum for Metoda, okay, treasures Maldum for before, in front of, metoda. There's only one meaning for that word, God. Completely omitted from the modern English translation. It doesn't say he scorned the treasures. It's not in there at all. Mavim for metoda. Treasures, mavim. That's there. But he scorned, it's not there. And then the last part, he did not know their love. Ne his mina wisa. His mina. Not their love. What's he talking about? Nor did he know God's love. This is why Grindel couldn't occupy the throne which is treasure before God, nor know his love. In other words, there is something sacred about the throne. Only the king can occupy the throne. It is as if, Grind, you know, if this were the throne, Grindel comes up and he suddenly boom, he bounces off in invisible force. He can't go any closer. And it probably drives him absolutely crazy because he wants to go in and sit in the big chair. Because after all, he do at night, we're told. He rules the hall. Can you really rule the hall if you can't sit in the throne? No. You can occupy the hall, but you can't rule it. Okay? Pretty important. That was deep misery. The Danes, that is Hrothgar, many a strong man, man sat in secret council, considered advice. What would be the best for the brave at heart to save them from attacks? So they sit around thinking, how are we going to deal with Grendel? And at times, we're told, 175, they offered idols at pagan temples, prayed aloud that the soul slayer might offer assistance in the country's distress. Okay. And this 175 to about 188. Many scholars think was added later by some Christian monk to baptize, let's say. Beowulf wants to Christianize it. Okay? Among those scholars, he's utterly wrong. Who am I to say he's wrong about anything? It was J.R. Tolkien. One time when I was at the, yeah, at the Bodleian Library, working on some Tolkien stuff. I had them bring out for me his um, handwritten stuff on Beowulf. It's never been published. Some of it's been published in his essay on Beowulf. But in this, he goes on and on about how this is all spurious. 
He's wrong. It's central to the poem, as we'll talk about later on. Because what is being said? They, the Danes, offered honored idols at pagan temples, prayed aloud that the soul slayer, that Satan, the might offer assistance in the country's distress. Such was their custom, the hope of heathens. Now, this tells us something about the nature of the narrator of the poem, or the speaker of the poem, or the poet of the poem. The poets are looking back on a period long before, right? They remembered hell in their minds. They did not know the maker, the judge of deeds. They did not know the Lord God, or even how to praise the heavenly pleasure of glory. Okay, stop for there for a moment. They did not know how to praise the heavenly protector. What's been going on in their hall, in their capital? Every night, or however many nights, Grendel comes and he eats people. Because there are still, Rothbard's going to tell us later on, there are still Danes brave enough, drunk enough, take your pick, to attempt to fight them. And they go, and they sit in the hall, and they probably get totally loaded thinking it's going to give them a berserker kind of state, and instead they get so totally loaded they're dead to the world. So when Grendel comes in, he's like, oh, here's a tasty little appetizer. Well, that one's a little bit bigger. That'll be the main course. And he eats them all. So how much was the heavenly protector protecting them? Woe to him. This is another example of what we saw in The Wanderer. A gnomic passage. A wisdom, if you want, verse. Woe unto him, what? Who must thrust his wicked force in the fire's embrace, expect no comfort, no way to change at all. Thrust his th soul through wicked force means die. Who must die and expect no comfort, no way to change at all. In other words, go to the person who dies despairing. Who dies thinking there's no hope, no chance for a change. It shall be well for him who can seek the Lord after his death and find security in the Father's embrace. Now, I think that passage, that last couple of lines, is pretty important. Because it is almost totally opposite from one what from what one hears in oh the vast majority of Christian churches today, which is you have to turn or burn. You have to choose when before you die. Look at the language here. Who can seek the Lord when? There are many fathers of the early church who said death was the final point. That one could still choose after death. Okay? And it, that's what this poet is saying. This poet is not this arch conservative, the way some people have, do portray him. As you know, you love Jesus now, and you burn for all eternity. No. It'll be well, he says, for the man who can seek the Lord at the death day and find security where? In the Father's embrace. Not the embrace of fire. Notice that juxtaposition. The fires of hell or the loving embrace of God the Father. Okay, we'll pick up with what's called fit three on...